Before we take up how to study history, we might take a crack at why study history at all. Well, there's the old saw about those who can't remember history being doomed to repeat it, but history seems to get itself repeated with dreary regularity anyway, and if you doubt this, study a little history. But this takes us in a circle, doesn't it? Then there's the bit about being a good citizen who can vote into office an enlightened government that in turn ensures domestic tranquility, provides for the common defense, and promotes the general welfare, etc. Valid, I guess, and it maybe I'm just a little old and grumpy, but I'm not sure I see this happening nearly as much as we might hope. Besides which, it gets us perilously close to the whole those who cannot remember history thing. The best reason to study history, to my mind anyway, is it makes other stuff easier to understand and more interesting. Not just any stuff, specific stuff. Is there something you're interested in? It has history. I'll use myself as an example. I grew up in Colorado, and while Colorado's got nice mountains, it's poorly equipped with oceans, and as a consequence, I was fascinated by ships in the sea. I read everything I could on the subject. I'd have to say I learned a lot more about European history reading these books than I ever did sitting in Mr. Green's European history class. To use an even more extreme example, if you're into skateboarding, it is doubtful your research into the history of skateboards will teach you much about 19th century European history, but skateboards started getting popular in America about 1960 and were part of the youth movement. And a bunch of what makes America what it is today came about because of, or in spite of, the youth movement and the baby boomers' fascination with itself. And yeah, I'm one of those baby boomers, and yes, I did have a skateboard. Is music your thing? Ponder the history of music. Music has history, and some smart people, people that love music as much as you might, have rather a lot of interesting things to say about it. This is the history of music, but what about the music of history? As you will see in a moment, it turns out that it's easy to link the history of music with the big history, the history they teach in the classrooms. Finally, it's fun. This is perhaps not the most important reason to study history, but it's certainly the most compelling. Now, it may be that studying history is not, in and of itself, fun, but it makes other fun stuff more interesting and other interesting stuff more fun. Things like watching movies or reading books, or certain movies and books anyway. For that matter, watching certain movies is a pretty good way to learn history. But understand movies are more for reinforcing your studies in history. They kind of flesh it out after you know some of the people and places, and yes, you've got to know some of the dates, at least a few of them. Think of it this way. Studying is the main meal, the meat and taters and veggies and all. The movie is dessert. Knowing a little history also makes certain kind of interesting books even more interesting. Here's a tip. When you take up a book, even when you read just for fun, turn to the page right after the title page and check out the copyright date. This gives you some useful history. It's worthwhile to ponder, perhaps for just a moment, what the world was like when the author was writing. What do we know, think, and feel now that's different from what they knew, thought, and felt when the author was pounding it out? Did this book change history? Probably not, but some books did change history. Maybe the book wasn't written a long time ago, but has an historic setting. Some such books go by names like Gothic Romance, Historic Fiction, Costumers are my favorite, Bodice Rippers. Some of these books actually get the history almost right, or at least not far wrong. But right or wrong, if you know a little of the history of the period, I promise you the book will be more interesting, if only because it lets you see how thoroughly the author did get it wrong. I sometimes forget to check the copyright date before I start reading something, and I find myself asking, when was this written anyway? I'm often surprised at what I find when I flip back to the copyright page. Either I find the author wrote a long time ago and I'm impressed by his or her prescience, or not so long ago and it strikes me that the author kind of missed the boat. Or sometimes I think, wow, they had some funny ideas back then. I am not sure showing off is a particularly good reason to study history, but so many people know so little about history that I have to include it in one way or another. Think of it this way. Not only will studying history make other stuff more interesting to you, it will make you more interesting. Maybe, for example, you might impress someone, someone besides your mother that is, by wondering out loud if a given cold snap is as cold as it was in Moscow in 1812 when Napoleon failed utterly to conquer Russia. Let's come back to music and see where it might take us. There is musical history, and if there is musical history, there must also be art history. And if there is art history, might not there also be some writings on the history of fashion? Dang right. Changes in fashion were influenced by the same historic forces that influenced economics, warfare, exploration and migration, and all the other things that people think of when they talk about dry old history. Fashion history doesn't do a lot for me. The maritime history does, as I mentioned earlier. Now, mind you, ships and cannons are one step closer to the history of warfare than the length of women's skirts. But what about women in pants? 
Well, the fact is that women's pants became fashionable only during World War II because women were working in the war materials factories. Is this history? Dang right. In this example, whether you come to understand fashion very well by studying history or gain valuable insights into history by understanding women's fashion makes no difference. So you might think of studying history as looking for ways to help yourself see history. Do you want to see the Renaissance? Read all the books you want to or spend a single afternoon in a good art museum. See which gives you the best bang for your buck as far as understanding, feeling, seeing history. I do hope it goes without saying that you'll do a little of each. Ideally, the dull preparatory work of reading just a little before you put on your comfortable shoes and head out to the museum. It's the same analogy as a healthy meal and then dessert. Let me bring it home now with music in the year of 1812. We Americans tend to think of 1812 as when the English and the Americans fought, pay attention here, what's called the War of 1812. And this is almost right, but it misses a lot of other important history. A Russian composer named Tchaikovsky wrote a killer overture called, stay with me now, the 1812 Overture. You're listening to it now, and I don't care how into modern music you are, the 1812 Overture is some gutsy music. But anyway, how nice for this Russian guy to write about an American war. Except he didn't. For starters, he wrote in 1880, some 68 years later, that what he thought he was writing about was Napoleon's freezing his Tukhasov outside of Moscow. Remember from a couple of slides ago? But the Americans' War of 1812 and Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture are related. America and England went at it because England was stealing sailors off American ships. Actually, they were enslaving sailors. Let's just call a spade a spade. They were doing so because they were fighting a desperate war with Napoleon. This war involved, among other things, using a lot of ships to blockade Napoleon on the continent. The English needed more and more sailors. It could have gone either way. And in fact, Napoleon was winning everywhere his armies went until they marched off late one summer to take Moscow. They took sweaters and they took their time. This was a bad idea. Five out of six of them froze to death. And this was the beginning of the end for Napoleon. Consider another piece of music. When Beethoven wrote his third symphony, he actually named it Napoleon in praise of Napoleon. Then Napoleon proclaimed himself the Emperor of Bavaria, and Beethoven was so disgusted that he changed the name of it to the Eroica, which is Italian for heroic, but had nothing to do with Beethoven. A few years later, and just to rub it in, Beethoven wrote Wellington's Victory to celebrate the defeat of not Napoleon, but Napoleon's brother Joseph Bonaparte. Now this music is thought to be of minor importance by those wacky musical historian folks, but I like it because it records actual rifles and cannons. Definitely worth a Google and a listen. We're listening to it now. By the way, the Wellington in Beethoven's Wellington's Victory is the same Wellington who would defeat Napoleon himself at Waterloo in 1815. Just a couple more slides and a couple more points I want to make about why study history. History is everywhere. There are those that think history belongs in the social studies classroom. I disagree. I'll say it again. The key to really understanding something is to understand its history, and it doesn't matter what the subject. I mentioned the Renaissance a moment ago. A hugely important part of history. In fact, in order to understand or see the Renaissance, it's almost a requirement that you study or look at the art of this era. Yes, there are certainly important people and places and wars and dates and all manner of tedious history stuff, but there are also beautiful paintings and sculptures and architecture and certainly even music. It's hard to say if it was changes in the world at the time that brought about the changes in art and music or the changes in art and music that brought about the changes in the world. Consider science and history. Science has its own history. This long, hard uphill slog from ignorance to enlightenment, such as it is, that we enjoy today did not come easily. Think of this. Today we marvel at the ignorance of people who lived a thousand years ago and were quite sure the earth was the center of things. Poor, ignorant, silly old dead people. If the mathematics involved in sorting it all out back then is probably beyond the ability of, and I'm just guessing here, 90% of us today. I'm not sure I could do it, and I teach math for goodness sakes. Sure enough, there is history in math as well as in science. It might be a bit of a stretch, but there's also useful history to be pondered in the craft of writing, too. It may not be the kind of history that has dates and people and places and all, but certainly there is value in knowing at least a little Latin and Greek when you sit down to write a paragraph. Actually, you probably know more Latin and Greek than you think you do. And for that matter, the history of English language itself is worth a ponder. How is it we came to speak this little orphan of a language based somewhat on this old, old German language imported from Germany to this little tiny island off the coast of Denmark named Frisia? Fascinating stuff, all of it.